All right, I think we're ready. Just checking to make sure it says we're moving. Yeah, I think we are. All right, um, today what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a variety of different printers. That, uh, all but one are FDM style printers. So they are molten plastic squirting out onto a bed, layer by layer, you know, all of that. Um, one of them that we're looking at will be a resin printer. Uh, I don't, there are many other types of printers, right? Uh, we mentioned a couple, I don't know, a few lectures ago. Um, we talked about uh, the SLA printers. We talked about the um, uh, laser centering, like the metal powder printers. We talked about some others. Um, I don't have those where I can just, uh, you know, <laughs> put them on the table over here and let's look at them. Um, most of those printers are, you know, they start at $200,000 or $150,000 and go up from there. Uh, and so I don't just have one of those sitting around, but I have a variety of FDM style printers that we can look at. And each one has kind of a, a reason why it's different. Um, I do have one that it's a little bit large, so I won't be able to show it and we'll just talk about it. Um, and it just has one, one feature, maybe two that is, um, different from these others. So I thought I would just kind of give you a, a, I don't know, a tour of these different printers and what about each one you might be interested in. These are all, I mean, let me look. Um, well, some of these are a little more expensive on brand name and component quality, uh, but they're all it's probably still in the hobby level. Many of them are in the really affordable level. W one, one of them is kind of expensive, uh, but it is a really good printer. So uh, that's why I'll, I'll throw it in the mix also just show what, if you're interested in that kind of printer, what uh, you might be, uh, why you might be interested in it. So let's just start. And I've got the chat going over here. If you have some particular questions or comments, maybe, maybe you have one of these printers and uh, you want to give some insight on it, that's perfectly fine. Um, I will try to look at the chat and comment on it if I see it. All right. This one is just the one we've been working on, so there's nothing new here. But um, it is probably your introduction to printing for most people, or many people. I don't know if it's most. Many people start with this style printer. Um, and so I wanted to start with it and, so, and describe some of its features so that we uh, can compare with other printers and how they might have different features. So some of the things about this printer are that it is a <clears throat> Bowden tube. So this tube um, feeds the filament into, well, the tube doesn't feed the filament, but uh, the filament feeds through this tube into the hot end. And what that does is it relocates this stepper motor back here that's actually doing the feeding. So this stepper motor doesn't have to move back and forth when the print head is moving. So this is called a Bowden tube setup where the feed motor is separate from what has to move around to do the printing. So that's one thing about it. Um, the other thing is that there's only a single lead screw right, raising the Z axis. So raising the gantry here up and down, um, there's only a single screw. Some of the ones that we'll look at, there'll be two of these. Um, there are good and bad things to that. Um, with the single screw, the bad thing is that, um, this end of the horizontal carriage gantry um, does not necessarily move at the same rate as this end. There can be a little bit of lag between this end moving up and down. Um, now I've got mine pretty well tightened to where I don't have a lot of difference between if this moves, then this is going to move instantly. Um, but one thing you could have is this screw right here is one of the eccentric nut screws and so it can move in and out as you turn that nut um, and if you have that tuned badly and this one also this one is also that way um, but if those are tuned badly then you can raise this end and this end hasn't moved yet so there can be some slop in there when there's only a single lead screw um, driving one side um, and so you do have to spend a little bit of time tuning these and by tuning i mean getting your wrench out and adjusting these eccentric nuts until there's enough tension i don't know tension not the right word um enough pressure between the wheels here and the rails so that you are um not allowing a lot of slop in this gantry um 
that's not terribly hard to do. You can get it too tight to where you actually uh, put flat spots on the wheels here, and then you have these little place, places where it gets stuck, and so that can be a problem. Um, other than that, this is a really good entry-level starter printer because it is not very expensive. It generally prints well just the way it um, comes from the factory. You know, you, 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 we watched building of this one uh, the very first I think it was the very first day um, and you basically bolt the the, uh, the actual frame to the bottom base and then you do a little bit of assembly down in here and within a hour even for somebody who hasn't done one before you're probably able to print um, now we've added a few little things we added the BL touch so that we can detect the bed height and adjust for any warping or unlevelness there um, we did add a magnetic bed sheet printing surface. Um, we added, uh, instead of springs, we have solid um, mounts here for the bed. And then we just printed a couple of things just to kind of sometimes not do really anything but make it look different and test out printing. Other things have, you know, some amount of function where you can't um, drop accidentally filament or nuts and bolts down into your control board through the fan. Um, so that's kind of a, a baseline starting setup. Um, these are there are a lot of styles of this though. You know, this is the Ender Three, um, and there are other brands that do very similar things and at similar price points in the two hundred and on sale even less. I think I ended up paying one seventy for this particular printer. Um, so that's where we're starting. Let's look at another one, and I'm gonna have to. I want to do a lot of like moving around here to try and get things situated. I need to unplug this one though. All right, let's look at this one. So this little guy, this is a really tiny printer for one thing. Um, and that's not the point of it. It's just tiny because, uh, I, I don't know, it's just a small printer. Um, these, let's move the print head down. These are what's called a Delta printer. And so you can kind of see the, the triangular shaped drive system here where um, there are actually three lead screws. Well, not screws, these are belts. Um, so on the sides in here, it's going to be dark in there so you can't see it very well. I wonder if I can light it up a little. Not really. Um, there are belts with stepper motors. This one has the stepper motors in the base. Um, and those belts can drive these carriages up and down. And by moving all three of those up and down, you know, in a coordinated fashion, you can print all over the place. The uh, good point of these is that the base doesn't move. The base stays still. And the only thing that moves is the print head. So typically, like on the one that we just looked at, the Ender 3, um, moving that base back and forth um, at any high rate of speed is probably going to cause some kind of ringing. Um, there, or you're going to have to print kind of slow. Uh, you know, there's just more mass that you have to account for moving. There are some ways that we'll look at later. Uh, later in the quarter, I don't even know when I have it, but it's quite a bit later in the quarter that you can programmatically account for the fact that you know the bed is going to shake around a little bit. Um, you can even use an accelerometer to measure that amount of vibration and account for it. Um, but that's not a simple thing to do and most printers don't come with that installed. In fact, none of the printers I have come with that feature enabled to begin with and you have to add it on. Um, but here, the base where your print is stuck down doesn't move at all. And there are other printers like this also in the this rectangular format. They're called Core XY printers where um, they don't have the Delta motion system. Um, they have a motion system more similar to the Cartesian printers, except that the print head moves in X and Y and the, the bed moves in Z. So Z is really, you know, moving pretty slowly. So you drop the bed down uh, a... a uh, whatever layer height, 0.2 millimeters or whatever you're printing at, and that motion is usually not very fast and you, it's not going to create a lot of ringing. Um, and so the, I don't have one of those to show you. I kind of do have one 
um, that's similar to Core XY, uh, at, at least where the print head moves around. Um, the Core XY particularly talks about how the print head is moved around, uh, the belt system that does that. Um, I do have a printer, but it's one of the ones that's kind of hard to move, so I can't really get you to that one. Um, but the, the advantage here is that the bed doesn't move. Typically, this part that does move is really lightweight, so you can get really high print speeds off of these things. Um, this particular one is the uh, Monoprice Mini Delta, I think is the full name of it. Um, there's a version 2 now. This is the older version 1. And um, it's really tiny, like like I said. But what it's good for is anything that you, you either want really fine details, so you don't want the uh, ringing. You'd still want to print kind of fast. Um, and maybe a part that's going to have to be stood on its end, you know, a really, really skinny part that if the bed is sitting there, it's going to vibrate back and forth um, and break off or have an un clean top part where it's rattling around and you're trying to print on top of it moving back and forth um, those kind of prints are really good on here because of that um, the way that the bed does not move the downside to delta printers is that they they can be difficult to calibrate you know you, you the the motion a little bit of slack or a little bit of um, uncoordinated movement and the bed uh, the, the way the printer sees the bed is more like a bowl or a, a dome. And so you can get kind of some warped parts holding really tight tolerances. It can be difficult on these type of printers just because of the motion system. Um, but you can get really fast printing um, because you don't have to move the bed. And you can get uh, detailed printing in general. Um, and anything with high aspect ratio, so tall skinny pieces are much easier to print on something like this where the bed doesn't have to move. Um, this particular one, I don't know if it's the one you would start with. It is cheaper. I got this one on, I think I got this one last year's Amazon Prime um, day, I think is when I've got it. And I got it for about the same price as the Ender 3. Um, I don't know that it's currently that price. I'll, I'll look and see. Let's see. I, I did look up. This is the one I would actually get if I were getting a Delta printer is one of these FL Sun printers. And they're in the, you know, you can see 270 range. Well, well, two, 240, I guess, because you get a $30 coupon, or at least I have one on these. Um, I don't know if that's a prime deal or what that is, but um, these are much larger for one thing. Let's see, 200 by 200 print size, and they usually have a really tall print size. So that's another thing. High aspect ratio prints where they're tall compared to how wide they are, um, are generally good on these printers. Um, like I said, they can be... A little bit tricky to hold dimensional accuracy but they they can do it um, in fact let me see if I can oh I don't know if I can get it down it's pretty high up there um, I did print some little models um, transformer guys from the 80s um, on this printer on this one and it snapped together type thing and the snaps were all fine um, I did not go in and measure like if the dimensions of things were accurate or not but um, they were good enough so if you're trying to print like parts that have to interface with other parts these style could be a little bit tricky to do it's not impossible at all it's just you might have to do a little bit more calibration on them um, but I would go with one of these FL Sun printers I haven't gotten one myself um, I'm not sure well I'm running out of room to put printers for one thing but um, I would probably get one of these if I were really trying to get a Delta style printer. They're, they're a good uh, printer for a reasonable starting price um, if you're looking for the Delta format of printers. Um, this particular one, it's more of a project than anything and it was on sale. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a fun printer to work on um, and it's a different style as far as uh you know the the motion system and it does come in handy if i'm trying to print something that keeps falling off the bed because it's too tall and skinny on one of these other printers um this one also has on it a thing i'll show you um if you do get lots of little pieces of filament samples or or whatever this print uh again it's on thingiverse i i don't know if i could find it easily or not but this is a good little spool holder for well spool 
uh, for holding filament uh, that you get that's not already spooled, so you get samples or whatever, or maybe you trade with somebody and you get this handful of filament. Um, these are really good because you can just put the roll on here and then screw it back together um, without having to wind it. So now I can get it, to, to it back together. So it's a nice little printable filament spool if you have lots of sample filament pieces. Yeah, uh, I get those uh, samples in the maker box, and so this kind of thing is good for that versus trying to re-spool them. All right, so that's the Delta one. Let's see, next, next let's go to the expensive one, or compared to these others. Compared to these other printers, it's expensive. Compared to commercial printers, it's not really expensive at all. This one, it's not on the screen. Let's back up a little bit so we can try and get it in there. Um, this one is the Prusa MK3S, uh, I believe. I don't think it's the plus. I think it's just the S. Um, so this, this brand of printer, Prusa Printers, they um, have been around a long time. They're one of the more original of the kit style hobby level printers. They do cost a little more. Um, like I think this printer was maybe seven hundred dollars. Let's see if we can find it. Uh, online here, get an idea. Well, this is the uh, plus. So this is well, this one's a slightly um, newer version. Has a slightly new set of features that the one that you're looking at on the table doesn't. Um, and unassembled so a kit form it's 750 um, I think that included shipping I don't actually remember um, but it's a kit and it's not the same kind of kit as the Ender 3 where you have two pieces you bolt them together and you're done um, it's a kit where you assemble every little thing so it's good if you really want to get in there and look at every piece um, all these orange pieces are printed Actually, some of these black pieces in here are also printed. This is not part of it. This is a little camera mount that I have on there. Um, the These, the frame is, um, I assume, laser cut or water jet. Looks like it's probably laser cut steel. So it's got a very rigid frame. Um, it does use some extruded aluminum pieces down here, some rails. Uh, it doesn't use the V-slot, so you have sliders on here. Um, so there's there's essentially no you have the whole table shaking. Um, there's essentially no slop in the bed or in the print head. So it's a, a rigid setup, which is good. Um, you're paying for that rigidity. You're paying for um, you're paying somewhat for the the firmware that runs the thing. Um, it is as much as these level printers can be self correcting it is that it does diagnostics test on itself and it it does have a um, bed sensor that's not the be able to touch i don't know if we can see it it's this little guy over here they call it the pinda um, and so it's one of the ones that's a it's contactless um, and it does uh, go and probe the bed um, i think it does a four by four grid i can't remember now it's five by five or four by four um, it does a pretty decent map of the bed before every print. Um, and it is a direct drive printer, so there's no tube. You see the filament comes straight into it. Um, so the drive motor sits right on top of the hot end. Um, so that's good in the sense that where we had that Bowden tube on the Ender 3, there is some, uh, basically you're creating a really long spring with the filament running through the Bowden tube here there's there's very little unconstrained filament path if any you know the the amount of filament that is unconstrained meaning it's not in a tube or in the hot end is millimeters of distance in here um, and so what that does is it means you can print with more confidence that um, what you're telling the feeder to do is actually happening to the filament there's not a not a lot of give in the system where it might be springy in the Bowden tube or whatever you have a lot more precision control over that that's not unique to the Prusa printers you can you can add a direct drive system to your Ender 3 if you want to you can take the parts of your Ender 3 print mounting brackets and turn your Ender 3 into a direct drive with 
I don't I don't think you'd even need any other parts. You could use the parts only in your three to turn it into that. Um, I'll see if I can quickly find the Thingiverse set of files for that to show you that. Um, I haven't actually done that myself, so I can't say for sure. Um, it does have dual Zs. So there's a Z rod on one side and on the other side. Um, that in this setup, that actually works really well because of the auto leveling system. So it goes in and um, this one doesn't use limit switches. It uses a current draw on the stepper motor. So whenever it senses that um, it's having to add more current to make the gantry move one way or the other, then um, it notices, hey, there's an increased current draw. I'm stuck somewhere. I must be against an end stop. And so the end stops are just physical stops. And it uses the feedback from the system itself to know that it's at one of its limits. Um, all that to say that the problem with dual Z sometimes is that um, you, they do have to be in sync, right? And if they're not in sync perfectly, then uh, your, your gantry is going to move at some angle, some weird angle. Um, and then your prints will also have that angle embedded in them by default. Um, it has a lot of the same features. You know, it does have the bed moving back and forth. So it is a, what you might call a bed slinger. It slings the bed back and forth. Oh, moving the camera. Didn't mean to do that. Um, and so it is going to have the issue of potential ringing. Now, this bed is hard mounted. There's no springs. Um, it, there's a, aluminum standoffs between it and the base that the bed is mounted on. It does have uh, removable spring steel plates. It's got a, you know, a, a nice um, heat bed. Um, it has several, and this is, a, again, unique to Prusa, but it has several types of plates. Um, this one is a textured PEI, so it imparts a, a texture. Well, I don't know if you can see it, but it's the same texture that would be on its surface here so it's not a like glassy and it's not a um uh, just a flat surface it actually has a texture on it because it's picking up the texture from the print bed you can buy uh, textured print sheets for your other printers too um, they have some flat ones and, and different ones that you can use um, what other features does it have uh, that you might want to be aware of um that's pro those are probably some of the main features. Um, it is a lengthy build, particularly if it's the first thing you've ever built as far as a printer goes, it can be lengthy. The instructions are really great um, and there's there's very little um, uh, ambiguity in their instructions. So the, the instructions are really good. Um, would that upgrade do much for, oh, which upgrade do you mean? Um, <laughs> so, would that upgrade do much for quality of print? There's such a lag between the chat and what I'm saying live that I don't know exactly which one you're talking about. So which upgrade? Um, do you mean the textured bed? Um, that, it, it, I like it actually. I, I have um, a couple of these textured beds. Um, it doesn't change the quality of the print other than the surface that touches the bed gets this nice texture on it. Um, so it, it doesn't do a whole lot other than that. It is a PEI textured sheet, so it does help grab onto some parts, um, the, the filament itself while it's printing. Um, but any PEI sheet will do that and glue stick and, you know, painter's tape and all those other things can do that. Painter's tape actually, um, the blue painter's tape, it has a little bit of a texture to it and you can get a similar result just printing on painter's tape. This one is more, um, the, the texture on it is deeper. I don't, I mean, you can kind of see the, how it's not a smooth reflection. It's kind of sparkly. Um, that, that's the texture on it. Um, I do like printing on it. This particular sheet and ones like it, um, they do require a little bit of maintenance every now and then. I do have to go in, clean them with hot soapy water, and even run a little bit of steel wool over them to kind of reactivate the, um, the texture, the PEI texture on it. Uh, and it, if you don't do that after, I don't know, a week of printing on it or something like that, then uh, prints will start to not stick to it too well. Um, 
As far as the quality of the print though, the only thing it does is it does hold the prints down when it's nice and prepared and clean. Um, and it does give a really cool finish on that side that's touching the build plate, um, which I do like. I, I don't, I don't think you can see it at all though. I don't think you can on the screen. I don't think I have any way of letting you see this texture. Maybe, maybe you can see it on this piece up here if we really zoom in, cause it's on this top surface up here. Let's see if we can get it to focus on that thing. Too close. Maybe if we move a little further away. Oh, you could, you can kind of see it there. See how the, the surface isn't flat. So it hides all of the individual lines. Printing the piece for the, oh, oh yeah. I'll talk about that. Um, so uh, the, um, the texture here, you can kind of see what it does to it. And I do like that. So what you're actually asking about though, is the direct drive. Um, let me look real quick and see if I can find a printable version of that. Um, I have, all right, we're gonna look at this one. I don't know if this is even the right one. Well, this is for a particular nozzle setup. Um, so there are printable, you know, this one would not be for your base Ender 3. This one has a particular extruder associated with it. Um, they're actually adding a lot of different things here, but it sort of looks like this. This isn't the best one now that I look at it. This one that has too many, um, special parts. This one looks more like you can take your own parts. Um, so what they've done here is they've put the feeder motor right on top of the hot end where the filament's coming out. Um, and you can print the carriage mounts and everything to do that. What it does is if you are printing um, flexible filament for one thing, so we haven't really talked about that, but there are filaments that are rubbery and you can print them um, much easier if you have a direct drive or a little faster. You can print them a little faster. You can still print them on the Bowden tube. You just have to go really slow. Um, because some of them are, you know, very stretchy, very rubbery, and um, they will act a whole lot like a spring inside that tube, and it's hard to control their flow. Um, but a direct drive setup will definitely help with printing um, flexible filaments. Uh, for printing regular PLAs and ABS and stuff like that, well, I don't know if you want to print ABS on the open Ender 3, um, just for the fumes and things like that. Um, I don't know that that is what I would do for the purpose of having better prints with PLA. I would do it if I were trying to go um, print flexible material. Um, it does help a little bit as far as you do have better control over the, the filament flow. You can be more accurate. You don't have to worry as much about what's going on inside the tube. Um, but the the advantage of it is probably you lose a little bit of that advantage because you're going to have to um, move this extra weight around now that you didn't have to move before because the feeder stepper is also going to have to move with the print head and so you're going to gain a little bit of ringiness on the y-axis or the x-axis now because now the x-axis moving left and right is a little heavier than it was before um, so I would only do it really if I were printing flexibles. Um, this printer, I don't use it just for printing flexibles. Uh, this one has a really nice compact setup. Um, and it's, it does add weight in this direction. You can even see that they've got two, uh, rock guide rods for it instead of the one V rail where you've got the wheels rolling on the rail. Um, and so they are trying to account for that motion a little bit of extra inertia through these two rails. Um, and it is relatively light and compact. Um, and it is a better thing. I don't think I would take an Ender 3, change it over to direct drive, um, unless I planned on printing a lot of flexible type material uh, is why I would do it. You can certainly do it for other reasons. That's why I would do it. Um, let's look at well, let's look at the little version of this. There, this is the regular size version, but they do have a smaller one. So this little guy, um, first of all, it's, 
probably it's the only one I'm going to show today anyway that is a cantilever style so it only has one Z screw and it doesn't even have anything on the other side then the other side is cantilevered um, it also is um, well it has the magnetic sheets but obviously much smaller let's see let's get the other one where'd it go so here's the regular one and then here's the the mini we we'll have to zoom out to be able to see We're too close. So it is a quite a bit smaller print area, but that's not a problem to me for most things. Um, unless you really are printing large parts, then these smaller beds are actually preferable to me. First of all, the whole printer doesn't take up as much space, um, but you know, this is still a really large part to print all at one time. So unless you really are printing helmets or really big pieces, this is fine for pretty much any print I ever make, really, unless I am making a really large part that I don't want to slice into pieces. Um, but uh, this one is more of the Ender 3 style kit where it's uh, this, this part's all assembled and you bolt it to this part and you plug some wires in, you're done. So it's more of the, you know, 30 minute to 40 minute assembly time where that other one um, is a true kit that, you know, it's hours and hours to print it. This one's cheaper, um, usually I think maybe in the $350 range. So it's more than an Ender 3, um, but it is uh, cheaper than the other Prusa. I do like this printer a lot. Um, it's a nice compact printer. Um, it is probably, you know, could you build personally a better printer? Um, yes, if you knew how to build printers from scratch and you had all the parts and all that and you knew which parts to source and all that. Yes, you probably could build something cheaper. Um, but it does have the uh, guide rails. It, it does not have the V-slot stuff with the wheels that you have to align. Um, it does use printed parts. This is a printed piece printed piece here, printed, all the oranges printed. Um, this is aluminum and the base itself is aluminum, um, but there are printed parts scattered around on it. Some people don't like that. Um, I, I can look at it both ways where um, they, yes, they're printed, but if for some reason one of them breaks, I can print a new one. All the files are available where you can go and print any replacement parts. Um, so, and I've never had to do that. I've never had to reprint anything on one of these Prusas. Um, I suppose it could happen at some point though. Um, so I do like this one. Um, it is more of a user friendly kit. Uh, it is smaller, which again, I'm not really opposed to. It, it's plenty big enough for most prints that I'm going to do, um, on a regular basis. Um, and if I'm doing a large print, then I probably want something that's enclosed anyway. We'll talk about an enclosure that you can, um, add to a printer sometime whenever I grab get it out um, so this one is a good ish one the the downside is it costs a little more it does limit your print size if you want to print big stuff um, but it's a solid little printer um, they even have a kit not a kit a download where you can print a base that raises it up and puts everything underneath it and it's got feet under it and everything to try and um, deal with the spool being, you know, off to the side somewhere. That's why it's kind of just have it connected here. Um, so I do like this one also. The another downside of the Prusa printers is the lead time on them. A lot of times, um, there's weeks. This particular one, I bought it when they these were brand new, and it was, you know, six months before it came in. But uh, they do tend to have a long lead time on delivering the things, and they ship from I think. To check Poland, maybe Poland. I'd have to check to see. All right. Let's look at this. So this one is a bigger print. You can't even see all of it. Um, it's not a Creality. I have a Creality bed on it, a glass bed on it, but it's it's a. There's the name. JG Maker. This is the artist, I think, 
artist D is his name. Um, what's different about it? Now, this particular, I would not actually recommend buying this printer as your first one. First of all, it costs a little more. Um, I don't remember the price. Um, I think I did this one through a Kickstarter, so I don't even know what the current price is. Um, the It has some issues that you would need to be able to address. So you'd have to know a lot of, um, you know, troubleshooting things to get this particular one. Not this style printer, but this particular one. Um, what it does, though, is it has two independent extruders. So it's an IDEX, um, I-D-E-X, so independent extruder uh, printer. And so that does several things. One, it turns this into potentially two printers. So these things can move in unison, you know, and print two copies, either uh, direct copies or mirror image copies of the same part at once. So that's handy if you're trying to spit out a bunch of parts and you just want to double up your print time or well half your print time double up your print output um, so it is good on that the other thing it can do is um, it can print the same part with two different materials so you could have a material in here and a support material in this other one or two different colors like it's set up right now um, and you can overlap those two prints to have um, a multicolored print or at least a two-color multicolor print. And uh, you could also have a single-color print where one of these is a support material that uh, you dissolve away later. Maybe you're having trouble getting support the, to remove. You know, it's, it's a lot of support or it's, it's really intricate support that needs to be removed and it's messing up your model. Um, there, are, there are support materials that you can print with, but then you can dissolve with um, well, a variety of things. The, the simplest one is PVA, which is, you know, Elmer's glue is PVA glue. Uh, and you can just dissolve it with water. So you can drop the thing in a tub of water and the, all that support material that you printed um, basically dissolves away and you're left with your part without having to go in there and kind of snap out the support material like you would on a single extruder printer. Um, there are other, that one of the other printers that I would show you it's just harder to move, um, is the similar idea, except the two extruders are not independent. They're, they're basically one thing and they're separated by a set distance and you can feed two different things into them. Um, and you can do the same type of stuff, except you can't do the independent extruders. So this extruder, uh, can't do anything that this one's not doing because they're the same extruder on the other one. So there are multi, nozzle extruders that are not independent um, this one the difference is and there are a couple they're not many printers set up like this but there are a couple of these idex printers out there now um, and they're typically big because one of the things you might want to do with them is print two things at the same time um, one on the left side and one on the right side uh, this again this particular one this brand um, and this is the first iteration, you know, they, they might have newer iterations now that are better. Um, but this is not that old. This is, I don't know, a year old, maybe at most, maybe not even that old because the Kickstarter was last October sometime. So this is less than a year old. Um, and, and so it's, you know, there's still some bugs to work out on this thing. Uh, and I would not recommend it as your starter printer because there are a lot of things that you have to go in and. Uh, you know, figure out how you're gonna how you're gonna troubleshoot some of this stuff. Um, overall, it does a decent job. There's just a lot of figuring out. Uh, the slicer is relatively straightforward. I just use Cura to slice the parts for it, even if it is a multicolor print. So how you do a multicolor print in most slicers is you have two models, and one of them represents all of one color and the other model represents all of the other color, and you overlap those two to create the actual shape you want, and it just, whichever color needs to be printed at the time, uh, it will go and use that nozzle to print that color or that material, that support, whatever it is. Um, this one might, if somebody's interested in that, it might be worth spending a little bit of time looking at uh, a print on this, but I would need to get this printer running better it runs and it prints but the prints aren't 
very nice. You know, they're kind of kind of lumpy and it just needs some tuning. Um, but it does, it works fine. It does what it says it does. It's just uh, the prints aren't as clean as something that is more obvious how it's working. Um, the advantage of having the two independent extruders over doing a multicolor print another way is that you don't have to have quite as much waste material. Um, I have some uh, side equipment over, over here, you can't see, um, that uh, adds the ability to do multicolor onto some of these other printers. And it does, a, they have a single nozzle, but um, five different, four different, you know, depending on which system it is, filaments running into that one nozzle and they all get kind of paste to where the right filament is coming out at the right time. The downside to that version of multicolor printing is that um, there's that transition zone between the two different colors that you just printed and the one you're about to print. And so there's this mixing. And so you have to go off to the side somewhere and purge out that mixing. Here, there's no mixing. You know, the, the blue only comes out of this side and the orange only comes out of this side. And I'm, I'm not flip-flopping orange, blue, green out of the same nozzle. Um, and so I don't have to do as much of that purging. Um, you can kind of see over here, it, go, it goes and it does wipe the nozzle off so that in case it drooled or anything like that while it wasn't printing. Um, and then it comes back and prints. But um, you don't have to print entire what it's called a purge block to get the color, the current color. Um, we'll look at multicolor. I'm pretty sure I have multicolor printing set up. Um, yeah, on July 2nd is when I had, so relatively soon. Um, we'll, we'll look at how that can be done on a single nozzle printer. This IDEX type printer is a different way to do that. Plus it gains you the ability to do two smaller, you know, they can only be half the size of the bed, but two smaller prints simultaneously, which can also be a time saver. Um, you could also just have two printers um, for the price of this one, probably. Two Enders, anyway, Ender 3s. All right, let's get it out of the way and look at another one. All right, this one is more of what you can do if you um, want a particular thing. You can't go buy one like this. So it's an Ender 3. This is probably the Ender 3 from two summers ago, I think. Or, or maybe from a winter. I don't remember. But it's one of the class Ender 3s from a while back. Um, it is converted to direct drive by a... Um, this is called the uh, Titan Agua. So, uh, as in water. So, this is a water-cooled filament. It doesn't have the fan blowing on it. Water-cooled printer, not filament. Um it doesn't have that fan that blows on it. It actually has water that circulates through it or cool. And it's not just water. Um, why you might want to do something like this. There's not that many reasons why, but so you'd have to be a very particular reason why you wanted to do something like this, but there are things like this out there. They're generally not very cheap, but you're doing something, um, very particular. You want to print some really high temperature filament. Like for instance, I got this sample. I got this sample in the box the other day. Is this it? No. Let me find it. Here it is. So, I got this sample of filament the other day. This is PEI filament, but the hot end temperature on it's 350 degrees Celsius. The bed has to, it's supposed to be at 150. I don't think I can get this bed to 150 without it being enclosed, but um, 350 degrees Celsius is not going to print on a normal hot end. It's got to be something that, um, it doesn't have to be water cooled necessarily, but you've got to have, first of all, materials that inside the printer are capable of exceeding 350 degrees Celsius. Um, before they begin to break down. The Bowden tubes that you have on the Ender 3 by default are, you know, they're Teflon. Um, and so they're going to begin to break down at 250 Celsius, you know, just right above where you print PETG. Um, so there's no way they would survive 350 degrees. Most firmware won't even let you uh, get your hot end 
past 300. Uh, and so you have to go and modify the firmware to do that. So there are materials out there that print at extremely high temperatures, but you might want to print them because this material has glass transition, heat deflection, whatever you want to call it, 185 Celsius. So if you want something that's going to go, you know, in the engine bay of a car or whatever like that, an actual uh, part that you print that goes into a really hot environment, then you've got to print with material that has really high heat deflection temperatures, which means really high, even higher uh, printing temperatures. So um, this one I built for that purpose so that you can print some really hot t filament um, on it. Um, it does have a BL touch on the side just because, um, but it's got the water cooled. You can kind of see back in the back over here, water cool setup. It's not, so all of this, none of it exists is the other thing. Like this, you can buy this, but nobody really has built all the fixturing. So you have to design the mount here. You have to design something over here and print it out. Um, and you can kind of see it's not quite, you know, there's a little gap in here we need to work on. Um, the other thing, and this is something regardless of if you're doing water cooled, but you're trying to um, add things to your printer, particularly electronic things. This one does have, it's up at the top, so you can't really see it. It has a light bar across the top, so an LED light bar to shine down on it, um, which I actually kind of like that. Uh, it that's not the reason for this particular part, but I've got this guy back here because um, your power supply, you can kind of see it in the background back here, uh, it's gonna either output 12 volts or 24 volts, and some of the other parts of your printer, if you're, if you're kind of building your own thing, um, are gonna run on 12 or 24 most of the time. Um, and if, let's say that you have a power supply that outputs 24 volts, but your pump for your uh, water cool takes 12 volts, then you've got to convert that. And so you might have to do things like this, where um, this is a buck converter to go down. Actually, this one's adjustable, but you can um, find some that do a, a, to a specific voltage, just to 12 or whatever. Uh, wh where that might show up on Ender 3s is the, uh, Ender 3 is a 24 volt printer but you might want to add some silent fans to it. Maybe you, it's, the fans are just too noisy for you. Um, they're not terribly noisy, but it could be uh, annoyingly noisy if you're running it a lot and you're hearing it a lot. Um, and a lot of those silent fans are 12 volt fans. And so you've got to figure out how are you going to supply 12 volts from a 24 volt system. Um, and one way to do that would be one of these style little converters. They might make chip style ones also. They don't have to be this fancy one. This, this one is bigger because it's adjustable. Um, and it gives you a little readout of what you're actually sending out and all that. So this one is more not something you would really want to do. It's just a thing that's out there that you can begin to piece together if you're trying to do very particular things. So in this case, hot, high temperature print settings um, without destroying your uh, Ender 3 printer. Um, Let's see, what else do I have over here? All right, I've got one other that we'll look at. All right, this little guy, in fact, um, this so this one is definitely different from the others. The others are FDM, you know, they're molten material squirting out. This one, um, is a resin printer. This is a smaller resin printer. I did, I don't want to do too much on resin printers today because I did, um, I did just find this guy. I ordered this. Um, it was on a, a prime day, like yesterday I ordered it. Um, and this one is larger and um, I don't know. Well, it has a couple of things. We'll talk about this mono, what that means. Um, it's 4K, you know what 4K means. Um, again, more expensive. Um, it was actually on a little bit better sale yesterday, in fact. Um, I guess yesterday was Prime Day, and it was one of the Prime Day deals. Um, what these do is there's a vat of resin. I'll, leave, I'll open this up for a little bit, but this resin that's in there right now is a pretty smelly resin, so I'm not going to leave it open for very long, but I'll open it for showing. So 
inside here is this greenish yellow resin. Um, this is a um, ABS-like resin, so it's not ABS, but it is a liquid, so you can kind of tell it's sloshing around in there. It's a liquid that um, underneath this little trough, this uh, vat, is an LCD screen, like on a phone, maybe a larger phone, but uh, a small tablet, larger phone. Um, this is actually your print bed up here, and prints will end up hanging from this print bed. Um, I can already start to smell it, so I'm going to close it up. Um, that is one of the downsides to these printers, is that some of the resins are very uh, aromatic, and usually not in a good way. It, it's kind of, um, I don't know, you don't want to smell it for very long. So I have this printer off in another room, well, a little, little room over here on the side, and um, with a like air filter and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot more like peripheral type things to print with one of these. What you gain is super high detail. I showed last time, and I don't even, I guess I put them back over on the thing. I might can get them in a second. I showed last time the kind of detail that you can get out of these printers. Um, it's, it's until you see it in person, you wouldn't even believe what could the detail that you can get from a little printer like this. This one, um, this smaller one is 200. Well, in fact, so here, this isn't it. This is a different brand. This is the one that I just got with we're actually going to look at when we do the resin day. But um, the smaller version, which is the same size as the one on the table, apparently is 250. Um, well, it's on sale right now. Actually, it's it's $200. 40 40 dollars off of 249. So it's 2 210. That's a really good deal for this one. Um this is a mono. So the mono refers to the screen itself. Um the original ones of these had color screens like really they were cell phone screens. Um uh the mono is mono cut chrome so it's black and white. Um and that's actually better for this thing. What it does is it uses the screen as a mask and so underneath the screen is a UV light source so there's UV light shining up uh, through the mask which is the cell phone screen or the screen I get, you know they're getting bigger and bigger so it's more like tablet screens now um, so it's, it's shining through there and wherever it is the screen is black or a dark color the UV light doesn't shine through and it selectively cures the entire bottom layer or the current later layer of this resin inside here. The resin cures with UV light. Um, the mono lets you pump a lot more UV light through there uh, than the color screens did. And the 4K, obviously, that just means you have a higher resolution. So um, the, the Vantage not only is detail that you get, but it's um, the fact that you can print however big that little bed is in there now this one is not very big but however big it is you can print the entire thing at one time and it doesn't add any print time um, whereas on the FDM printer you fill up the bed it's going to take days to print the whole thing here it's the same amount of time the height is what actually matters how many layers are you doing and the layers here are you know for a FDM printer you're printing at 0.2 millimeters maybe you sometimes drop down to 0.14 millimeters or whatever these the rough layers are 50 microns and they go down to you know 10 20 microns and so you can get very fine detail um, on these style printers for um, this particular one you know 200 210 220 dollars something like that um, and then they get a little more expensive as they get larger but uh, if you're interested in detail printing these are probably the way to go if you are a messy person, these are not the way to go. They're extremely messy. Um, that resin in there, you have to wear gloves and everything. It is caustic. Um, uh, some people, it, it reacts like if they get it on their skin, it will give chemical burns. Um, other people, it doesn't react to quite as bad. And there are better and worse resins. Um, you know, there are some water washable resins. Most of the time, these are uh, cleaned up with IPA, isopropyl alcohol. Um, and so it's a messy process to deal with the print and the cleanup. So if you're if you're a 
clumsy, messy person, definitely not the thing you want to do. If you don't have a separate room you can put these in or outside in a garage or something like that, um, probably not what you want. You don't want to sit beside one of these things while it prints the whole time um, because uh, it, it can be pretty smelly. Um, so there are some definite downsides to these. They are uh, messy, smelly, can be caustic. You know, the chemical resin itself is caustic. And so there's a lot of other things you have to consider with these. But if you have all that, if you generally are careful with your work and you have a place that you can put this printer kind of off by its side or you build its own little chamber basically and exhaust it out a window or something like that so that you're not breathing the fumes then um you can get really high detail let me go i, I know i showed them yesterday or last class but let me go get so you can see This is the most recent one that I have handy. So let's put him up here. Let's see if we can look at him and get him to focus. I think that's kind of in focus, but we'll zoom in. So, I mean, you're just talking detail that these tiny little peaks over here are gonna be really hard to print on something that's a uh, FDM style printer. You can you can get FDM to print similar quality, but if you're trying to get super fine details, um, you're not going to get better than with the uh, resin style printer. You just have to take on the, the downside of having to deal with the um, cleanup. Now, I have, <clears throat> let's see, right now I have it listed July 23rd is when we're gonna do a whole day for resin printing. Um, you know, actually run some prints and, and show what it takes to clean up. Um, I have, let's see if it's, let's see if I have it in here. Mm, well, I don't, it might be, maybe it's in the recommended stuff. Uh, yeah, so I have this system, or one like it anyway, not this exact one. One like it that helps with uh, cleanup. So. Uh, you know, not not particularly cheap. You don't have to have this, but I'm just telling you the things that um, make resin printing much easier to do is this is a wash and cure sta station. So you take your, um, actually here's a cheaper one. I'm not sure what at this one adds, but uh, this one's cheaper, still 150 though. Uh, well, no, it's 110 by the time you click all the, well, 120 when you click all the coupons. Um, but what this does is you've got a vat uh, that you can just keep isopropyl alcohol in. You take the whole print surface, you take the whole thing, the little bed off of here, it unscrews, put it in the vat, put it in the machine, and it does the washing up. It even has L, uh, UV lights in here so it can cure the part. A lot of times you just have to sit them out in the sun to cure. Or maybe you have a, um, a UV chamber that you've made or whatever. But uh, there is some other part. There are some other parts to 3D printing with resin that aren't obvious right up front. You can make do with just the printer. But stuff like this makes it much simpler to do. Prusa has a resin system. I've not used it. Um, I think it looks really good, um, and it probably costs a little more. Uh, let's see if it's, let's see if they've got their resin. It's this one right here. Yeah, it's a lot more. <laughs> so, um, I'm sure it's really nice, but it is quite a bit more on the expensive side. Um, it says it's SL. Um, so that SL, usually, I don't, it, usually that means selective laser. Um, but it could just be light. So I don't know if that, this machine looks like it's the same style that's doing a light based one versus a laser based curing. Um, I don't know. I haven't, haven't really looked at their machines that much, but, um, so it is a way if you want super high detail, uh, to go in there and relatively affordable price, uh, start into that, but know up front that it's going to be messy and smelly 
and uh, you need a you need to put it somewhere else. You know, it's kind of all right to have your Ender three in a not as confined space. These printers, I wouldn't have them anywhere other than on their own little combi confined space somewhere. Even if I built a cabinet for them, something like that. Um, all right. There are other style printers. Um, there are other add-ons that you can add to printers to, to make printing a little bit easier. And we'll cover a lot of them through throughout the rest of the quarter. Um, those are the main things other than I don't have like that core XY to show you just cause I don't have one of those printers here to, to actually show you what it looks like. Um, but that kind of gives you an idea of some of the different sort of entry level. Some of these are a little more expensive. Um, printers types that if you're really into printing and you want to do a new thing or you want to try a different thing, these are some of the things you can try. Um, so for next time, what I never did get any like sp specific request to do a particular thing next time. So what we're going to do is this. Let's get this guy out of the way. We're going to, we're going to do this. So we're going to add an all metal Hot end, and there's all the pieces for it in here, in here, and we're gonna add an all metal hot end to our Ender 3 that we've been working on. Um, so what this will do is the all metal part means that it yes it does still use the Bowden tube, um, but it does the Bowden tube doesn't go down into the melt zone of the printer you know, hot end, um, and so this one will let us print some higher temperature material um, and it's a E3D um, V6 hot end. Uh, the all metal part is actually this piece right here. This little this little guy, the heat break. We'll look at all the pieces individually um, next time and, and that'll also give you a, a kind of tour, detailed tour of the hot end itself. Um, maybe you're having issues with your hot end. They're all similar um, this particular one uh, just has this piece here that is all metal and the tube doesn't go down in it. It stops above it, uh, well, above it over here on this end. Um, whereas on the Ender 3, this tube can go all the way through there. Um, and that puts the Teflon too close to the melt zone. Um, so we'll, we'll do this. This is a mounting system I got for it. You can print mounts for these these type of things. Uh, I just wanted a aluminum mount for it. So thought I'd get this one. I've never used this one. So we'll see how it goes. Um, so that's next time we'll, we'll go in and change it, see what's involved in changing out our hot end to be an all metal hot end. And, um, we'll go from there. If you have suggestions on things, um, you want to do, let me know. You can kind of see the, the schedule that we've got planned. Um, all metal hot end. There is a quiz coming up, by the way. Um, some things into the multicolor printing. Um, this multicolor we're going to do with a single nozzle, with no change, like just in slicing the file, um, all the way up to some systems that let you take five filaments in and mix them all together and print. Um, some finishing techniques, some uh, modeling techniques, some different motherboards. Uh, there's the resin printing, you know, different things. So if there's something that's on the list, but you want to do it sooner or not on the list and you want to, you want to look at that, um, we can certainly change these things around. Just let me know, um, what you might be interested in and we'll see if I have any knowledge about it or if we can figure something out about it and we'll look at it. All right. Um, I'll see y'all on Friday. We will look at our all metal hot end. See if we can get it mounted and printed. Um, it'll probably take the whole time to do that. I imagine. I don't know. I haven't used this particular mount or anything. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, it should work fine. Um, see you on Friday. <laughs>